We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we're doing something a little bit different today that I'm, I'm really, really excited about. Me too. We're back to our F101 series, which I feel like we haven't done in a long time. Yeah, it's 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 been a, it's been a few weeks. Um, but yeah, today we are going to be talking about something that was released a while ago. Took a little bit longer to trickle down into the states, but we are here to talk about um, how much we loved Gunther Steiner's book Surviving to Drive, and also why you should read it too. Absolutely, huge advocate for this book, especially the audio book. I really really enjoyed it. Um, I listened to it, and it was so much fun. I love Gunther, and hearing him talk in his crazy German-Italian accent um, just yeah. made the book so much better. And you could it's like you didn't have to envision him saying these things because he was saying these things. So it was good. Yeah, really the, the, the book was very much written by Gunther Steiner. Like this this was not ghost written. Um I don't I think it was very lightly edited. Um I don't think these are our problems. I think that this is the best way for Steiner to um express himself in this book. Um but yeah, I think that one of the the highlights of the book was like this was not the fancy pretty polished book that you would get out of someone like Christian Horner or Toto Wolf if they no, were hundred percent a hundred percent I feel like Toto's would be very like proper though just because he is such like a whenever I see Toto in his like crisp white collared t-shirt I feel like he's just like a proper individual so his book would be very different but this is a hundred percent Gunther and his style which I oh, really yeah. appreciate because when you have a ghost writer sometimes it just really takes away from the impact the book makes personally. Yeah. So. Also, before we dive in to um, some of the highlights of the book and things that we really loved about it, um, I do want to acknowledge that I read this book while I was at camp over the summer. So we, we read we read this a few months ago, um, but my best friend has been get, um, angling for me to read this book series that he loves uh, for the last two and a half years, and I have not done that yet. Um, and I will get to it at some point eventually, uh, but this was a lot faster read, so I'm sorry. No, this is a really good one. I, <laughs> I listen to the audiobook while I walk my dog every single day, and so I, I think it took, like, maybe a week to get through it because um, old man Winston can only walk so far. But yeah, um, it was really good, and it gave me something to, like, look forward to, to while I was doing it. But, yeah, we did get through this a few weeks, months ago. So, But we took good notes. Yes. Yeah, it was uh, it, di- diving, and I think one of the – the things that is is kind of like an undercurrent to the book itself is like Haas shouldn't exist. Like no. fundamentally as a Formula One team, they should not exist and could not exist if they were coming into the field today. Like we, no. we've seen um, over the last, what, year, year and a half with Andretti's efforts to get Andretti Motorsport into Formula One, and that is still an ongoing process as of, you know, recording time. They're expecting, I think last I saw, to be on the grid in 2025. Um, but what what Gunther reveals in the book, like, is mind-boggling that he basically made it happen on his own with no support or I mean he had a lot of support but like no legal advice and managed to get a formula one like an FIA license well and when you hear the whole story when he goes into it it's like this is it seems made up almost because it's Mm -hmm. like not like you said there's no way that they could do it today Andretti's going through a whole long process of like a, a lot more than it seems like Haas went through. I feel like Gunther being in motorsport for so long had a lot of, like, connections and relationships that he really capitalized on. But like you oh, said, yeah. there was no one giving him legal advice on how to go about this or how to even do it. It was very much just, like, a hope and a prayer that this was going to work. Yeah, he, he really, like... I, I don't want to say that he, like, winged it because he very clearly didn't. And he had, like, Gunther Steiner's been in motorsport forever. Yeah. But, like, it, it everything just really fell into place in, in, in a way that y- y- we're never going to see again. No. 
you know, I think this was like a, a once in a lifetime event, let's say. Yeah, exactly. Any and other team or any other person, I truly don't believe if they had another person at the helm trying to start a team could have done it except for Gunther. No, and I mean, it, it helps that, you know, Gun Gunther is kind of crazy in a way that we love um, and the way that, that, you know, through Drive to Survive has made him famous. But, it, like, you have to have that audacity of, like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to figure this out. And, and he did that and he managed to take... Um, you know, what was Gene Haas, um, who has a, a very thriving industry in motorsport in the United States and in the other motorsport categories and turn it into, you know, a thriving Formula One team that, you know, is a financially stable Formula One team. And that's one of the things that 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 search for financial stability is something that um, we we see come into fruition towards the end of, of the, the book and, and how. Gunther details the, um, you know, the, the signing of the, the contracts with MoneyGram, who's their current, one of their current major sponsors. And it was a big contract. Yeah. Read the book and you'll see what the number was. Yeah. Their, and the general just, number. Just off of that, like, we don't want to give too many spoilers. We just want to make sure, like, we talk through the parts that we loved and kind of give you a little snippet on why you should read the book as well. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, so, so read the book to find out just exactly how Haas became financially stable. <laughs> and also the more of the details on how Haas became a team, because I think all of the details are really, really important and interesting to know, like how many hoops Gunther jumped through and how committed he is to this team. It's not like he just became, you know, a princ team principal or like so much part of Haas just randomly. Like he really started this from the ground up. So seeing everything he did in the hoops and everything – it's really not seeing, but listening to or, or reading. It's um, it's a really good story. So, yeah, and he he intersperses the book with stories of his history with with motorsport. He he's been around motorsport longer than we've been alive. Yeah. Um, and he's he's seen every facet of you know anything that has to do with car racing, including some wild ass stories of from his him rally days. From the rally days, oh yeah. My gosh. Hearing about Africa was like insane. Right. Yeah. Again, yeah. teaser to why you should listen or read the book. Yeah. Um, Even if you have no life. interest in anything outside of Formula One, the stories that he tells of like the rallying and all all of the the other other stuff that that he's done that brought him you know to the point where he is now with Haas is still absolutely fascinating. It's something that I didn't expect when I when I started reading the book, um, but it was definitely really enjoyable to read. Yeah, no, and like this isn't a spoiler because everyone talks about it, but I didn't realize just how much he worked with Carlos Sainz senior not yeah junior who's racing now for ferrari but i did not realize like how close like he was his mechanic and they worked together for so long and he spent how like 200 plus days on the road with him one year um i did not realize like how close they really were and how much they actually worked together yeah, it, it goes to show you just how small a world motors, motorsport is, especially when you have, you know, the, the drivers, you know, once they're done with Formula One, they're going to still be driving in other motorsport categories. Some of them even do that, out, you know, in the off season. Um, and it's it's just it's fascinating just how ev it, it's it's Everyone's such a small connected. world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of small world, I love that when he was let go from Red Bull because he used to work for Red Bull. Christian Horner's the one that fired him. <laughs> yeah. And now he works with Christian Horner in a sense because they're both team principals. So I think it's just, again, very small world, not a lot of positions within these teams. People are very kind of interchangeable, intermingling. Um, and it's very, it's almost like a really small town. How everyone yeah. knows everybody, everyone knows everybody's past, present, future, whatever. Um, it's really interesting how, how truly connected it is. Yeah, exactly. And, and one of the most interesting things, and this is like, when I started reading the book, I was like, okay, when are we going to get to the thing is, you know, the thing, you know, what Gunther said about his perspective of everything that happened with Nikita Mazepin and Mazepin's family and the Yerkali sponsorship of Haas. Um, and, and it was definitely a, for legal reasons, I cannot tell you what my real thoughts were, um, but 
uh, they, it gives you enough to, you know, make it worth it to go read the book, even if you're just looking at, like, wanting to know what happened with, like, Mazepin and Mazepin getting fired and then going to Kevin Magnuson and bringing him back to the team. Yeah, and so to take, like, a little step back and give some context on why this was interesting and, like, anticipated, at least from us, Mazepin is a driver from Russia and when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, the FIA kind of made a decision that they were going to, you know, stand against that and ban Russian activity, let's say. I, well, especially because Haas it's, is an American team and Ukraine is, you know, a Russian sponsor. There were some, like, lines being meddled or whatever. So if you watch Drive to Survive, you just see Gunther, like, walking around with the media being like, no, he's gone, like, and doesn't really speak much on it. He goes a little bit more in depth on like the hour by hour, let's say, recap of what was going on. So it's kind of interesting to see all of the details that go into that decision, how it was made, who they were talking to, what went down, and then ultimately, you know, K-Mag's coming back to the team. Um, yeah. But it just goes into greater detail there. So if you aren't super familiar with why um, Mazepin left or who Mazepin is, um, hopefully you caught that from Drive to Survive from the show, but they do go into a lot more detail in the book. Yeah. Also to add, um, due to a very long his sordid history of cheating within Russian sports athletes everywhere, specifically in the Olympics, um, which is something that came out after the Sochi Olympics, um, Basically, all Russian athletes internationally right now are not allowed to compete under the Russian flag. They're under the, I think it's the Russian Athletic Federation, That's which right, is yeah. separate from, you know, when, when you're watching, say, um, the U.S. Open, the tennis tournament, um, everybody, you know, in the scoreboard, if you're, if you're like an American athlete, you'll have an American flag next to you. And if you're playing an Australian, they'll have an Australian flag next to them. Um, Russian athletes have no flags because they're not allowed to compete under the Russian flag right now. This is a long ongoing saga of sagas. And um, I, I honestly don't know when Russia is going to be able to compete under their flag again, but it doesn't look like it's going to be anytime soon. Yeah. Um, and the, and so when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, there was a lot of like pressure to divest from anything Russian related and the Russian sanctions. And Haas has gotten into a little bit of trouble because they didn't, you know, tie things off quickly enough, among other things. So it's it's a whole very complicated process. And um, Steiner's perspective on the Mazepin portion of it specifically was, you know, that's what everyone was looking for from the 2022 season. Yeah. And I'm glad we got it. And I'm glad we got it like in his words and not like twisted by whoever. The legal team. <laughs> the legal team. Exactly. So, um, we also get a lot of his unfiltered thoughts on, um, the German media, <laughs> yeah. which, uh, was probably one of my favorite pieces of the book. Um, mm -hmm. It comes up a few times, I want to say. Cause, so Mick Schumacher is German, was driving for them during this season, and the German media did not have great things to say about the team. Um, neither did Mick's uncle. Um, Ralph and, Schumacher, former, <laughs> former Formula One driver. Yeah, not just a random uncle. Like, does have some standing in the sport. Um, but it's super interesting to hear him, like, just kind of lean into them a little bit. Not too much, but just, like, passive-aggressively let it be known he doesn't love them. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, that was pretty, that was something that I, I really, you know, obviously I don't follow the German media because I don't speak German. Um, so it was really interesting to, you know, find out that that was, you know, that there was, there was some needling. Um, he, he really goes into a, cu a couple major, um, incidents, especially toward the, the end of the season, you know, when everyone was questioning of whether, you know, Mick was going to be resigned for 2023, which spoiler alert, he's not driving in the field right now. <laughs> I was like, it's not really a spoiler because everyone knows who on, who's on track. So yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, no Mick just... Mick is in the garage with Toto. Yeah, no, he is. Um, I really wanted to see him get a seat. Sorry, I took a way off track and not talking about this book, but I w I still wish the best for Mick, and I want to see him in the seat eventually. So 
though. Yeah, he, he's got such a great legacy. He was also in, which Gunther acknowledges, he was not in a great car. No, um, especially his rookie season. Um, they, they, they knew that. And a, another part of, of the, the book was, you know, talking about rebounding from basically intentionally 2021 being um, a shitty car. And they yeah, knew that. like sinking it basically because they just needed to scrap it and move on. So, Yeah. And then on the other side of the garage, we have his perspective on his relationship with Kevin Magnuson, which has obviously gone, you know, through through many years and many iterations. And of course, the fuck smash my door incident from Drive to Survive. Such a um, highlight. Such a highlight. Iconic. Um, Gunther uses the word fuck a lot in the book it's it's pretty great and if you listen to the audiobook like i did just hearing him it's just like yeah i can i can just like see the expression on his face and um and hear him say say it constantly just it, it warmed my heart a little bit <laughs> I yeah loved it. yeah so. it, it it was it was it was great um and there was a little a little tidbit about um something that kevin gave to uh or the kevin probably gave to Gunther uh, before the Australian Grand Prix um, that I, I can only imagine what it would have been like if Gunther was doing um, Sky Sports that weekend uh, with how Gunther had been feeling during that race. No, not at all. Poor guy. The other really interesting thing that I don't know if a lot of people know about, maybe it's just because we, you know, hadn't been in, you know, really seeing a lot of Formula One news by the time we got into the sport was Gunther and Andreas Seidel from McLaren, bef- um, he, who was the team principal at the time. I thought that was really, his perspective on that was really interesting. And like of all the team principals for Gunther to like have a rivalry with, I didn't really expect it to be that one. No, I didn't either. I thought this was, this piece was kind of like not out of left field, but very not, in my view, I guess. Mm-hmm. My yeah. Finder, if that's what the word is. I can't think of the word I'm r- r- ruminating on. But, um, but yeah, I did not see that one, see this part of the book coming at all. Yeah. And I, I think it was, it was it when they were talking about budget cap stuff. I think so. Yeah. Think so. Yeah. Yeah. The other, yeah. like, unexpected like, beautiful, amazing relationship that I also didn't really realize was the one between him and Nikki Lauda. Oh, my God, yeah. how close he was to the family. And, like, it makes sense if you really take a look at it and, like, the timing. But I did not realize how close they were and how, like, Nikki was like, let me make some calls. And then all of a sudden, like, things are moving. I was, which, for someone like Nikki Lauda to do, I feel like you have to be really close. And hearing him talk about, like, his family and stuff like that, it was, it was really cute. Um, I can just imagine, like, Gunther and him, I don't know, I feel like they're kind of not the two that you would imagine having, like, this beautiful friendship, but right. it was really, it was really cool to, like, hear him talk about it. Like, you could tell when he was reading it, like, the emotion in his voice, like, he really was a really good, true um, friend. So. Yeah, that Nick, Nicky Lauda's passing is definitely something that continues to, you know, hit people in the Formula One world even to this day. Like he was an advisor for Mercedes for many years. He was one of Lewis Hamilton's mentors. Um, and he, he's like, you know, Nicky Lauda is Formula One. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Um, the other person who's just Formula One that I love Gunther's take on and I'm like team Gunther thoughts on this 110%. Mm-hmm. Martin Brundle's gridwalk. Yes. And he talks about it and says, all these people are coming here and they think they don't have to talk to him. And like, they don't understand if you're here in our world, you work by our rules. Like this isn't, I don't care who you are or where you're from. If Martin talks to you, you're talking to him. I was like, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, Gunther. 100%. 100%. I think it's really dumb if you go to a Formula One race you're there and they're going to ask you about the race. They're going to talk to you. You're going to have to do Martin Brundle's gridwalk because that's what you do. And people who are like, mm, no, mm, no, like go somewhere else. <laughs> you're not wanted. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. Like, like part, like as, as two people who very much want to be featured on, on Martin Brundle's gridwalk one day, um, we like, 
it's n- like I I get it. You're very famous, yeah. um, and and very famous people do have some blind spots and may not know you know that there's this little news bit that happens right before the race where this guy is running you know running down the grid talking to people. But a you should be warned by someone, um, especially if you're going to be on the grid during grid walk time and you're famous. Um, I don't think that it is unreasonable not to just, you know, even just as you're walking, do a flyby on the microphone and say, hey, happy to be here. This is really freaking cool. Go whoever team I'm supporting. I think that that is the barest minimum that you have to do. Like even like um, we're recording this after, um, the Brazilian, uh, the Sao Paulo Grand Prix, where Machine Gun Kelly, who was off in La La Land, probably did not want to do that interview. It was a very oh. uncomfortable interview, but he did it. Oh, it was so cringy for like everyone involved. And uh, to be fair, I feel like that's kind of just him and his personality. Probably yes. But like, there's been a lot of celebrities before him, like this season, last season, all the seasons before, where it's very awkward and uncomfortable because they're like, "Hi." No. Yes. And it's like, okay, then, like, go go away. And, like, I know he walks up to you randomly, but still. And then you get people who are so lovely. Like, Michael mm-hmm. Doug- Douglas and Kevin yeah. Jones were, like, sought him out. And they're like, can we be on the grid? Like, everyone. But that just goes to show, like, some people are there just for the celebrity of it. And to be like, I'm at an F1 race. And some people are there because, like, they're true fans and, like, love the sport. So if you know and you love the sport, then you get it. But I don't know. It's just... It's interesting to see how people on the um, gridwalk respond. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, I so I full disclosure, I was at um, Arizona High School State Volleyball Championships all day yesterday, so my brain is kind of mush. But there, um, but what's his face, McDreamy um, from Patrick from Grey's Dempsey. Anatomy, Patrick Dempsey, that's the name. Um, he also like. And, and he was doing it for marketing purposes, which whatever, it's yeah. fine. He can do it for marketing purposes for the Ferrari movie. But he also, you know, definitely had plenty to say. Um, and it's like, it's not that hard to take up 30 seconds of your time. Martin needs to keep walking anyway. Um, so just just talk to the man. Yeah, I know. Just just talk to him. I still yeah. think the funniest grid walk of this season is when he was trying to wish Esteban Akon, or Este- yeah, Akon a happy birthday and like left the Piastri interview to be like, Esteban, Esteban. Yeah. And he like came back and, and Piastri, Piastri was, gone. was gone. So good. So good. The grid walk is like a staple. Yeah. It's my, one of my favorite parts. But Yeah. It's, um, it's great. Something else that we've talked about a lot on this podcast, besides the grid walk and how much we love it, is also how much we love social media. <laughs> and God bless you. Thank and you. <laughs> um, the social media that comes out of Haas from Stuart Morrison, iconic. So Amazing. Good. The the um, pit wall going from six chairs to three and <laughs> like making that joke. Oh my God. Brilliant. Loved it. Dead, dying, yeah. done. Yeah. And like, so good. Yeah, and then there was, like, a Top Gun-themed poster that came out where, you know, Gunther was told that he looked really cool, and, you know, Gunther's like, I feel like I look ridiculous, which, if you've watched Drive to Survive, Gunther has done some ridiculous marketing things for the sake of getting the team money, so, like, Gunther just, like, Gunther doesn't know what fans think is going to be, like, hilarious or go viral or not, and he also doesn't care, but when he gets told, he's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. He's a hustler. Like he will literally oh, do yeah. anything. And I think it's funny how he talks about like his daughter and how she like will tell him how he's coming off and what people think about him. And he's like, I still think this is weird. I just, yeah. you know, I'm just a team principal. Like this is not, you know, I don't realize it. I have no idea. My daughter has to tell me. I don't pay attention. Um, he's so humble about it, but like also not in a humble way. You know what I mean? Because like he knows it's working. He knows everyone loves him and he's funny. Um, I'm really excited to see what Haas does in Vegas. Again, bringing Vegas back yeah. to the mix. But I, I feel like they'll do something entertaining or, or fun with uh, with Gunther. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, the, the guy behind behind the scenes, Stuart Morrison, is just, he, he is brilliant and, like, you know, we have so many, like, front-facing, you know, big names in, in the sport. But, like, that's a guy that I would love to see have, a, like, more recognition because he's just doing some really cool – like, Haas's social media among the entire Formula One grid is some of the best social media in all of sport. Yeah, and not just F1, we but need, all of sport. 
and and if if more sports teams handled social media the way Haas does, then it would just be a heck of a lot more of an entertaining place. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I forgot what I was going to say. It'll come back. I hate to me when eventually. that happens. Yeah. <laughs> to be you know as transparent as Catherine, I went to Taylor Swift on Thursday and Friday last night. I was supposed to go, but it got canceled, and so I am still in you know. Taylor Swift, La La Land, a little bit. So apologies for the cloudy mind, but... That's fair. Um, but I really enjoyed this book. I don't know. I think without giving too much away, I think it does get a tad repetitive. Yeah. Um, just because it takes you through the 2022 season. They kind of had the same issues with the car throughout the season. You hear kind of the same things throughout the season. You hear a lot of, you know, him being upset, mad. Um, but I do think it's really interesting to get such a personal in in-depth view of like a first-hand account of F1, how an F1 team is started, how it's run, um, different nuances of the season, things like that. So I, you know, obviously recommend the book, but um, there is just that little one tidbit. Yeah, that was that was when when I was reading it. I was, I, I remember there was like a period of races because he he does break it down basically like here's what happened Friday, here's what happened Saturday, here's what happened Sunday, and it's a which whole is, season, yeah, because you start at the beginning and then you go through and it's like okay Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so you kind of hear the same, yeah, yeah, and it's it's not that the book like the the writing itself was the problem. It was unfortunately Haas's performance that was the problem <laughs> because you'd get like Gunther being like here's what we went through on Friday and here's what we had to work on we had a great day on Saturday because they had a, they, in 2022 they had a, a decent Saturday car a, a, yeah. you know a decent car that could qualify well and then Gunther goes and Sunday sucked bye um so like Due to Haas, you know, that that was every weekend for the team. That was what was translated in the book. And if there was an issue with the book, I would say that's it. But only by virtue of the fact that he was chronicling something that actually happened. And exactly. what actually happened wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't this great, amazing triumph. Obviously, there were highlights. Kevin Magnuson coming back. Kevin Magnuson getting pole in Sao Paulo. Um, and you know, so there were, there were some highlights, um, but it, it does stick a little, you know, getting toward the end and just trying to, you know, get to the, yeah, get to the point already. Yeah. But nature of the season, not the writing, the writing was still good yeah. and entertaining, but it is kind of like, like, um, repetitive just with their issues and stuff like that. But, yeah. but overall, highly recommend. I did the audiobook. I know Catherine read it. Um, I loved hearing Gunther read it and in, in his own voice with his own words. Um, it was really entertaining. I found myself laughing out loud while I was walking Winston, just like to myself. Um, but overall I, you know, stamp of approval from Emily. <laughs> yeah. I, I really think, and I think we've kind of, you know, implied this, um, you know, throughout this, but I, I really appreciate the fact that it was Gunther in Gunther's own words 100%. and that it wasn't ghost written and it wasn't polished. And it, it was something that you would expect out of a team from North Carolina. Um, that is, you know, the, the black sheep of the Formula One family, um, you know, fighting to, to, you know, explain to everyone that they're not Ferrari sister team, which is another facet of, you know, how Haas is, is, is a team and how is, it exists in, in the relationship that they have to Ferrari and the relationship that they don't have with Ferrari. Um, so I think that, like, it, it was really cool to have, be able to have some of those insights and especially if you're a newer Formula One fan this is a great way to be introduced to some of the finer details of the sport that you you know you don't see on race weekends and that you don't see in Drive to Survive. No that's a really good point it's a really good book to get you know current insights because there's a lot of F1 books about like past very I'm going to say historical even though it's like 20-30 years ago that's a long time ago but this is a very current um, book to to get some more insights on. I also kind of liked how the book was structured, how it was more diary style rather than mm -hmm. just like full autobiography. It's very diary style and, and it's written as if he was writing it in a diary, not a diary, but like a journal, let's say. So it is like he does say the F word like five times in one sentence and I'm sure that happens multiple times, but that's like how he talks. So I appreciate that they didn't edit him out of, you know, his true voice. 
Yeah. Also, the fact that he was able to write this in season while doing all of the other things that he has to do during season, like, that's, you know, he he travels, like, you, there's so much travel involved with, you know, the Formula One season in general, and then there's all the extra travel that, you know, Steiner has to do because, you know, he's... Um, you know, based in the UK, but also based in the United States. And, you know, all of that, you know, it, you know, transatlantic travel outside of the Formula One season during the Formula One season is it's wild, mind boggling that he had time to write this book. Yeah, I don't I mean, it had to have been playing time. But yeah, I don't know when he did it. Oh, yeah, that's that's wild. But go read it or listen yeah. to it. Highly recommend. I, I don't love autobiographies all the time because like Catherine said like it's very ghost writer e but I really did enjoy this one so yeah it, it was it, it was great and it it's it was a quick you know read too. like it didn't take oh yeah long. yeah it I it, had I not been running a summer camp in the middle of, of trying to read this book <laughs> I probably would have read it in like three two three days R.I.P. to the summer camp days oh boy we went from your horrible wi-fi to my horrible wi-fi Oh my like god, that, yeah. It was never like both of the horrible Wi Fi's at once. We just wouldn't have right. podcast then. That so. that would have been crazy. Well. Anyways, coming up next, you guys can look forward to our Vegas Grand Prix predictions podcast. That will be yep. coming out later this week. Finally, we have Vegas. God bless. Who knows what that's gonna hold? But we're we're very excited to talk about it. So we hope that you guys tune in. But that has been our recap of Surviving to Drive by Gunther Steiner. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.